Welcome to Christ Alone Evangelical Lutheran Church of Thienesville in Mequon, Wisconsin. As we gather this first Sunday in the season of Advent, a season of preparation, waiting for the coming of our Savior Jesus Christ. As we gather for worship here, we invite you to join us in singing, in praying, and in praising our Lord, our coming Savior Jesus. Our worship begins with the singing of our first hymn, All Depends on Our Possessing. prayer of the day. Stir up your power, O Lord, and come. Protect us by your strength and save us from the threatening dangers of our sins. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first scripture reading for this, the first Sunday in the season of Advent, is recorded for us in 1 Timothy chapter 6 beginning at verse 6. This will also serve as a sermon text for this day as well. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap, 
and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. But you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the sight of God, who gives life to everything, and of Christ Jesus, who, while testifying before Pontius Pilate, made the good confession, I charge you to keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in his own time. God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see. To him be honor and might forever. Amen. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. So far, the reading from 1 Timothy. We continue our worship as we join in singing Psalm 16. Our gospel reading is recorded for us in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 16, beginning at verse 1. Jesus told his disciples, There was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, What is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management, because you cannot be manager any longer. The manager said to himself, Ooh, What shall I do now? 
My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So he called in each one of the master's debtors. He asked the first, how much do you owe my master? 900 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly and make it 450. Then he asked the second, and how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, take your bill and make it 800. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, you'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with very much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. The Pharisees who loved money heard all this and were sneering at Jesus. He said to them, You are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of others. But God knows your hearts. What people value highly is detestable in God's sight. The Gospel of the Lord. Our seasonal response. The Lord will come again in glory. The Spirit in the church cry out, Come, Lord Jesus, come. And our worship continues as we join in singing hymn, What is the World to Me? From our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who has promised he is coming again in glory, grace, mercy, and peace be yours in abundance. Amen. As I mentioned earlier in our service, we'll be following our epistle reading for this day, recorded for us in 1 Timothy chapter 6. I'll share portions of that text as we go along. 
My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, as the seniors in high school are looking forward to picking their colleges and the like, they also have to pick the various courses that they're going to be taking when they finally settle on a school. Among the courses, there's something that's kind of the same across all the different campuses. How the courses are rated, because there's a whole lot of science courses, there's a whole lot of math courses, and then you have to look for the number. And usually if it's 101, that, mean, that means it's a beginning class. It's a foundational class, which you've got to take first so that you're not lost later on when you get in the 201s and the 301s and the like. 101 has always been just, shall we say, listed as the easiest class to take, the easiest one to follow. When people think it's too difficult, we can become discouraged. We don't want to work at it because we know, well, we can't do this. And a lot of times Satan likes to work that same thinking in our minds when it comes to living our lives as Christians. That, oh, it's a 401 class. It's difficult. There's no way we're going to be able to pull this off. There's no way we can do it. We're going to be lost and befuddled and confused. We're really Christian living. I would say it's a 101 class. It's a class that's very easy as we follow the directions that God has given us. And so today, using the letter that Paul wrote to his young friend Timothy, we're going to view Christian Living 101. We're going to see that it comes in three simple chapters. The first chapter is labeled contentment. The second chapter will be labeled conviction. And the third section, where we get to the end, well, it's conclusion and coming to a concise conclusion. As we view this, we first want to get a little background to the whole section from 1 Timothy here. The opening verses, which are not part of the, the reading for today, but I'll share with you, he writes, If anyone teaches false doctrine and does not agree to the sound instruction of our Lord Jesus Christ and to godly teaching, he's conceited and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy interest in controversies and arguments that result in envy, quarreling, malicious talk, evil suspicions, and constant friction between men of corrupt mind who have been robbed of the truth and who think that godliness is a means to financial gain. You read that and we're going to say, was Paul writing today? When we think of all the problems, the unhealthy interests and controversies and arguments, the quarreling, the envy, the constant friction, we think, wow, Paul is writing to us today because that's exactly what we see too, don't we? We see in this world everybody who wants to follow their own teachings and their own doctrine. They want to follow what feels good for them. It doesn't really matter how it affects others or how close it is to what God would want. But that's where now Paul comes to the opening of the class. For Timothy, he writes, But godliness with contentment is great gain. Contentment. What is contentment? It's being satisfied in some degrees with what we have, not what we don't have. Think about it. We spent this last week celebrating Thanksgiving. Families gathered together around sumptuous meals many times. A meal that probably isn't served that way except in November for Thanksgiving. And we rejoiced in the many blessings God has provided. And then right away on Friday, Black Friday, we need some more. We thank God for the blessings we have, but we need some more. There's not quite enough there yet. And we have all the ads that tell us you need this and you need that. Now, admittedly, I'm not speaking against Black Friday. And I'm sure there are many people filling out their Christmas lists for friends and family. But I'm not quite certain all the televisions that are sold on Black Friday go to somebody else as a gift. I think there's many a den or living room that has a new TV in it because of Black Friday. Because we just needed one more TV, didn't we? Or we needed one more computer. Or we needed one more computer game. We think of all the things we think we need, and yet the Lord tells us in Christian Living 101, contentment is where it's at. He says, notice we brought nothing into this world. We can certainly carry nothing out. 
Until someone sent me the picture, I always was a fine to share the fact that, you know, funeral hearses don't come with trailer hitches. And then I saw a picture, they sent me a picture of a funeral hearse pulling a U-Haul. It doesn't work that way. We came in with nothing. We didn't, weren't clothed or anything at our birth. We came in with nothing, and that's the way, folks, we are going to leave. And so in the meantime, what? To be content. He says, having food and clothing, we'll be content with that. We'll be satisfied with our situation. That doesn't mean we don't strive to become better. That doesn't mean we don't strive to become wealthier or have a, a better life. But whatever we are, wherever we are right now, let's be content. Be content to know that well, we're forgiven and we are loved. And the God who created everything is a God who looks to us and says, you are my own. There isn't anything greater that we could ever possess than the love of Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father who sent Jesus to be our Savior, the love of the Father and the Son who sent their Holy Spirit that we would know God to be our God. He says, let's be content with that. He says, there are many people who want to get rich. They fall into temptation and a trap to many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. He doesn't say money is evil, but loving of money, where that actually becomes our God. How many, how many relationships and families haven't been torn apart because of money, because someone is in love with their job and they have to go to work instead of spending some quality time at home with family. That they're always striving for a dollar here or a dollar there. And what are they missing? Maybe just the contentment that comes with having a shelter that they call home, having clothes to wear to keep them warm, having food on the table, Oh, maybe not the sumptuous turkey and gravy and all the other things that come with the big fixings and the pumpkin pies, but food enough to survive. Many of us have not had to live in that situation where we don't know where the next meal is coming. We feel for those who have to live that way. But even then, we see a contentment. There's a picture that I know is hanging in many a person's dining room area where it has an elderly man and woman, they're bowing their head over one loaf of bread, giving thanks for this meager meal. We need to give thanks, my friends, to be content with what God has given us, because he has given us everything. Yes, the things of this world might not measure up to what others are spending and what others are using or what others are living for, but the salvation of our souls. That is priceless, isn't it? The love of God for you and me. It's a gift he has given to us, and that would be all we would need. Paul would say the love of Christ is what compels him on. And isn't it the love of Christ that says with that, I'll be content. To know that I'm always loved by the Lord himself, cared for, provided for, protected, Yes, at a time when we can be giving thanks, which should be a lifetime, we're living Christian living 101. To be content, not to chase after those things. Some people eager for money, we're told, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. How many people haven't gotten themselves in trouble? Because, well, money was important to them. And they thought a fast way to get it to would be to go to the casinos. And then they lose it all. And of course, there's problems. They get to stealing, embezzling, doing things to support what becomes not a joy, not a pleasure, not a game, but becomes a habit, becomes an addiction. How many people are chasing after the wrong things? Not settling for contentment, that this is who God made me, this is who I am, and I will serve the Lord in every possible way. First lesson, Christian Living 101, contentment. Contentment that is also followed by a conviction. A conviction that says, this is what I believe and this is where I'll stay. 
Paul wrote again to Timothy, but you, man of God, when he thinks of this contentment, he says, but you, flee from all this. Flee from all this eagerness for money. Flee from all this that would draw you away from me and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the sight of God, who gives life to everything, and of Christ Jesus, who while testifying before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, I charge you to keep this commandment without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in his own time. God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in an unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see, to him be honor and might forever. Amen. Notice as he says this to Timothy, he says, you flee the other things. Don't hang around. Don't figure I can work with it. Don't figure I can overcome it. He says, I want you out of there. You flee these things and what? Pursue, chase after, go after, grab onto, hold on to tightly righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Now, if we look at those categories, well, we'd maybe want to say, or there'd be people that would tell us, well, that's kind of boring, isn't it? Just being this nice person? doing the things that are right. What's the challenge there? Where's the excitement? Where are the things that would say, wow, this is really a life? How many people chase after what they call their bucket list, figuring that life won't be complete until they finish that list off? And really, do we need a bucket list? Is life not worth living unless we accomplish all these things? Well, we would know the answer, wouldn't we? It comes out of the chapter for contentment, but it also comes out of the chapter of conviction. That we are, like Paul, compelled to follow the Lord because of his great love for us. This is what we have for us. A conviction to do that which is righteous and godly, to live in faith and love and endurance and gentleness. Too often, folks, let's be fair, we don't, do we? I'm always saddened when young people who have made their confession of faith in front of the church at their confirmation, in a little while, church isn't that important to them. Their faith isn't that important to them. They would rather go with the flow and go with the crowd than to say, I follow Jesus. I follow the one who died for me, who made a great confession before Pontius Pilate that he was the Lord. He, yes, he was a king, but his kingdom was not of this world. And he came so that we might be part of that kingdom. But it's not just for the youth that give it away. Let's be fair. Aren't we tempted too to set aside those things that are right and good? Doesn't Satan just weasel his way into our life in such a way that we say, well, righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, gentleness, that's all fine. But it's maybe not for me right now. Or we'll have an excuse for why we're not doing it. And are there ever any excuses for not following God? Are there ever excuses for not doing what is right because we're too busy or I don't know how to help or some other excuse we can come up with? No, matter of fact, Paul says, I'll tell you what, you fight the good fight of the faith and take hold of eternal life to which you are called. It is a battle. Jesus never said it would be easy. He even told his disciples that the world is going to hate you because of me. Don't think it's going to be really neat because you're a follower of Jesus Christ that everyone's going to love you. That's not the case. He says it's going to be a fight. And Paul tells us, fight it. Fight the good fight of faith. I had a professor in college who every now and then when a student was having a difficulty staying awake in class, he had a very deep, mellow voice, and it was probably easy to do if you stayed up late the night before. He'd always go to the students and say, fight it, fight it. Yes, carrying out faith is like trying to stay awake. 
Stay awake in a world that wants to put you to sleep with sin. Fight the good fight of faith, he says, and you grab hold, you take hold of that eternal life to which you were called. When you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses, we're not sure where that occurred for Timothy. Did he defend his faith and his life and his living before others and made it very clear that he wasn't going to go to the way everyone else was going? Is that not the fight he gives to our young people when peer pressure would lead them to places and thing, doing things that they don't and shouldn't be? Is that not the same fight we fight when we want to serve our Lord? When Satan comes into our life and says, oh, you don't have to do that. And you don't have to support that. And you don't have to help out in this, these situations. No, the Lord says, fight the good fight. Hold on to that faith, which is eternal life, in which you've got that. And in the sight of God, notice, who gives life to everything and of Christ Jesus, make that good confession. This is what we're drawn to doing. And you see, it's not that difficult this isn't a master's course. This isn't a PhD course. This isn't a graduate course. This is Christian Living 101. For as we look at the cross and we see the love of Christ there for us, as we see what he sacrificed for you and me, let's be fair. Why wouldn't we follow him? What could be greater than the love that Jesus gives to us? What could be greater than the faith the Holy Spirit has worked in our hearts to say, this is your Lord and Savior. This is what, believe in this and you will be saved. Yes, there's a lot of tragedy in the world. A lot of tragedy just recently as someone mindlessly goes through a parade. And yet, Jesus is there with his love and say, this is what endures. All the plans that you make in life can change in a hurry. My love endures. Hold on to that eternal life to which you were called. I charge you to keep this commandment, he said, without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in his own time. He says, I want you. Notice he didn't say this is a suggestion of good Christian living. Oh, no, this is a commandment he gave. This is a directive from God himself to go without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. The time we walk on this earth, let's be fair, it's short. Even if it's 80 to 100 years old in the whole history of the world, that's not very long, is it? No, compared to eternity, it's but a speck of dust. But our Lord is taking us to eternity. And he says, I want you to hold on to that which you know to be true, that which you know to be my gift to you. Hold on to that, which God will bring about in his own time. God, the blessed ruler. And here's another important thing for us to take in. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortal, who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see. This is the one who talks to us. This is the one who loves us. No matter how close the friendship, no matter how important the status of the one telling us, if Christ isn't telling us, if we're not following him, we're losing. There is no glory in doing that which is wrong. There is no fame in bragging about the things one has gotten away with. There is only life in Jesus Christ the Lord of lords and King of kings. We see that in our lives. May it always be evident that we don't even see it as a command. We see it as a desire of something we want to do. The things we know are wrong, we flee away from those. We run away. Don't even matter if somebody wants to call us a coward. We will run. We will run because as we run and flee, we serve the Lord who loves us, who gave his life for us who made our life count and gave us the gift of eternity. But there's a third section. We're working on trimesters in this 101 class, okay? Christian Living 101 comes to a conclusion. Then he says in this ending, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. 
Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. You think about it. Truly life is the life lived for Jesus Christ. The concluding matter is that this life on this earth will end. And it's what we did in that life and what God has done for us in the life that makes a difference. It's, we're all going to reach that point, won't we? Where we all have to say goodbye to everything here. The things that we love, the things we cherish, and all the things that we have, all the gifts of God. And yet, if we don't have the greatest gift of all in his salvation in, through faith in Christ, we actually are paupers. We have nothing. So he says, command those. Notice how often he says this. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, not to say, look at all that I have. But really, look at all that God has given. Look at all that God has blessed me with. He says, go on for them, but to put their hope in God. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. I like the fact that when I talked about Black Friday and all the sales, that there are people that are thinking of others. They're thinking of others through charities. They're thinking of others through food pantries. They're thinking of others even as they go shopping and buy gifts. Oh, so-and-so will just love this. But really, the greatest gift we can give is the gift of hope in Jesus Christ. That's the only thing that never changes. They're going to warn you that prices are going to be high again or higher. They're going to warn you there may be empty shelves and people are all worried about that. But the one thing that counts, eternity, hope in God, that's what we really should be thinking about. That's what we really should be celebrating as we gather together. Notice he says, and in this way, when you are rich in good deeds and generous and willing to share, in this way they'll lay up a treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age. The coming age, which lasts an eternity, is God's gift to you and me. And that's it. That's the conclusion. Don't quit early. Don't quit before the fight is finished. Don't quit before the race is run. Don't quit because it would be convenient for you. Don't quit on anything because, well, no one else is doing it, and I seem to be all by myself in this way. Oh, no. Fight the good fight of faith. Hold on to that which has been given to you by God. Share the blessings that God has given. May it be with great contentment. We thank God for this life. May it be with a conviction that we stay with what God has given us. Stay with it to the very conclusion of our life. When God reaches out, awards us the crown of righteousness, and says, well done, good and faithful servant. It's not a difficult class, nor a difficult life. Jesus even says, my burden is easy, my yoke is light. It's Christian Living 101. Christian Living 101. May we all pass the course as Jesus passed it for us. Amen. And now may the peace of God that comes to us through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ ever keep your hearts and minds in true faith to life everlasting. Amen.
I invite you to join with me as we pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, you brought us safely to this new day. Defend us with your mighty power, and grant that this day we neither fall into sin nor run into any kind of danger. And in all we do, direct us to what is right in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. We bring our worship to a close as we join in singing, Forth in your name, O Lord, I go. We're so glad you were able to join us today as we gathered in worship of our coming Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and are prepared for his coming in our life for him. May the Lord richly bless you in the weeks ahead. We invite you to join us again as you are able to worship our Lord, the coming Savior Jesus. Oh,